My name is Professor Ian Chappell. I am Professor of Periodontology at the University of Birmingham, Director of Research for the Institute of Clinical Sciences at the University and also an honorary consultant in restorative dentistry. The most valuable aspect of the NAP event really was to be able to have an open and frank debate. And that debate took place after the evidence base had been pre presented. So we had quite a diverse group and many were quite surprised at the certainty of the evidence or the strength of the evidence that was available for some, for some treatments. But equally, they were surprised by the lack of evidence that was available for others. As I was a, a chairperson, one of, one of four chair people, if you like, for that S3 guideline workshop, I was able to share the details and the nuances of what really took place so that the KOLs could really get under the skin of the process and, and accommodate that in the discussions that took place. I think most importantly, the KOLs were encouraged to be critical of any evidence that supported a J&J &J product and to challenge without feeling under any obligation that they had to support that product. It had to be a very open, transparent and honest process. And the reason that's really important uh, and that people uh, really sign up to that is because ultimately their names are going to be attached to that consensus statement. And if the statements are to have any credibility, then they must be developed independently without any company input or any company interference, or they simply will be ignored, and rightly so. So for me, the key three messages and learnings that came from the recent advisory panel were, number one, a recognition that healthy gums shouldn't bleed. Uh, and there's a need to move the message to managing gingivitis and not periodontitis and to intervene at an earlier stage, if you like, in the natural history of the disease. Number two was that um, a, a key message people really fully accepted was that because the evidence base is very strong, that the use of chemical mouth rinse agents, chemical agents in toothpaste and in mouth rinses, as an adjunct to mechanical plaque removal, does provide a significant additional benefit to oral health. Now the evidence base is strong, but actually the recommendation downgraded that evidence base to an open recommendation. And that was for reasons of, of cost, if you like, for reasons of uh, the environment um, and other reasons. So the true grade, if you like, of evidence base is not reflected in that recommendation. And then I suppose the third uh, key message that, that came out from, from it was the spit don't rinse message. Because the spit don't min rinse message is very important for kids from a caries prevention perspective. But it's almost become too jingoistic and it doesn't actually really represent the evidence base. What it should say to be accurate is spit and don't rinse with water because that's what the studies show. But for children over the age of seven who are able to use man mouth rinses and control their swallowing reflex, not swallow the mouth rinse if you like, um, then really what we should probably be saying is spit don't rinse with water, but do use a clinically proven fluoride containing mouth rinse because the enamel uptake of fluoride is as good as leaving residual toothpaste in your mouth, but you get the added benefits of those anti-plaque agents within those mouth rinses. So for me, I think the people who were present benefited greatly and Jane Jay, I guess, should be quite proud really of their ability to produce something like this and then to disseminate the really, really important messages out there into the, both the public and the professional sector.